So I'm going to uh, <laughs> continue the discussion of this exciting neutron star merger from last August. Uh, like Wenfei, I was involved with the Sackler meeting two years ago, and my understanding is that my recorded online talk was used by the observers to figure out what theorists thought they knew before the event. So I'm hoping that this, that this talk maybe will be recorded, and, and maybe I don't hope. Uh, <laughs> and as O3 comes along, uh, uh, they, can, they can hold us to the fire again. Oops. Um, so uh, most, most of what I'll discuss in terms of the interpretation of this event was done at the large collaboration uh, of the dark energy camera, but I think most of the conclusions are broadly, re you know, uh, uh, reached by several different groups, and so hopefully that's uh, that's not too much of an issue. Um, I think the exciting thing about these neutron star mergers is that they provide us a variety of probes. Where do the heaviest elements in the universe come from? What are the properties of dense nuclear matter if you slam two neutron stars together? Um, and and you know, what are the fates of these mergers? Well, I think one question that's come up is, did this thing form a black hole? If 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 so when, and, and hopefully by seeing what comes out in terms of the radioactive powered emission, we can start to probe some of these questions. Um, so I think just to, to remind you, we don't, as Stefan mentioned, at least prior to this event, we didn't have any confirmed astrophysical sites where we knew that the heaviest elements, or that our process elements, half of the elements heavier than iron in the universe are being created. We know that there had to be site where you have a very high density of neutrons to get a very rapid capture of, of neutrons, but we didn't know uh, where that site was. Um, another, you know, open question that we have are related to the properties of, of neutron stars, which is uh, in particular the equation of state at, at supernuclear densities. Um, and these imprint themselves on the properties of neutron stars that we might want to know better. So, for instance, what is the maximum mass of a non-rotating neutron star? We know of a few that are well measured around two solar masses, uh, but above that we don't have many observational constraints, but that's controlled by the pressure of, of nuclear density matter five times roughly. Uh, saturation density. Um, and likewise, as we've already heard, one of the open questions is, you know, what are the radii of, of neutron stars, which is also controlled by the equation of state at somewhat, you know, lower densities. Um, but current, you know, observations, even when we account for uh, modeling the uh, tidal interactions of this neutron star merger, you know, still allow kind of, you know, 9 to 14 kilometer uh, neutron star radii. Um, so the outcome of, of a neutron star merger is a sensitive function, in, in my opinion, of, of two things. Uh, one is the total ingoing mass of the binary, which is something we hope LIGO can measure. And the other is this unknown thing, the maximum mass of a non-rotating uh, neutron star. Um, so if the total mass of the binary is very high or the maximum mass is relatively low, then when the two objects uh, coalesce, you essentially get an immediate or a prompt collapse to a black hole. Uh, and this doesn't involve the ejection of much material uh, formation of a small accretion disk, so it's a relatively, you know, electromagnetically quiet event, probably not entirely quiet. Um, but more likely what you go through is a temporarily stable uh, hypermassive neutron star phase where you create this differentially rotating neutron star which is temporarily supported by the fact that it's, it's rotating, you know, at breakup differentially. Uh, but then over some time scale, which is uncertain because it depends on what are the internal processes of uh, the viscosity inside the neutron star, uh, that differential rotation is removed and the object collapses to a black hole. But that process of removing differential rotation also pushes mass outwards, and so you typically get a fairly massive accretion disk if you go through a hypermassive neutron star phase. Uh, it's also possible that even once the differential rotation is removed and you've established a solid body rotating neutron star, it still doesn't want to collapse into a black hole. It's still stable and has to spin down secularly on a longer time scale. Uh, before collapsing to a black hole. And that would be the case if you had a very low ingoing binary mass or a very high maximum mass. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about neutron star black hole systems, um, but here what matters more uh, in terms of the outcome is the mass of the black hole and whether it's spinning uh, in the pl orbital plane um, relative and also the size of the neutron star. So if the black hole is very massive, it just swallows the neutron star whole. Uh, if the black hole is less massive and or spinning, it can tidally disrupt the neutron star outside of the horizon, and you can get a large tidal ejection and the formation of a fairly massive disk. So you can have two you know, different systems that end up producing the same kind of black hole uh, accretion disk structure. And the basic point I want to make is that, you know, at least right now, uh, exploring these heavy ion colliders in the sky, um, LIGO and Virgo are telling us you know, pretty detailed information this way, but they don't have a lot of high frequency sensitivity to tell us you know, what's going on after the merger. On the other hand, the electromagnetic observations are, are very sensitive to, to what comes flying out, and so we can try to put these together uh, to infer uh, th these different channels and, and think about the different possibilities. 
and in particular believe that this event did go through a hypermassive neutron star phase, but did not produce a remnant that survived for a long period of time. So that's something I hope to convey to you. Okay, so uh, we think that the electromagnetic counterparts of neutron star mergers are sensitive functions of the viewing angle, as Wenfei discussed and Raphael will talk about uh, in quite a bit of detail. Uh, this accretion onto the newly formed black hole uh, could power a relativistic jet, but we have to probably be within, we think, a tenth of a rating or so to see the full gamma ray burst if there was a successful jet. Um, if we're off axis, we can still see this, this small amount of material moving mildly relativistically. It may produce uh, gamma rays from a shock breakout. It, will certainly produce some radio and x-ray emission as it interacts with the interstellar medium. But that's a small fraction of the matter and actually probably a small fraction of the total energy of the system. Most of the energy and mass is coming out in more mildly relativistic material, which as it expands into space, produces these radioactive isotopes, which keep it hot and cause it to glow and produce this, this kilonova signature, um, which I've studied for a long period of time because I think it has to be there at some level and it's, you know, it's thermal. Um, we should be able to understand it, and actually, uh, it, it turns out to be quite tricky, but uh, nevertheless, I, I still have confidence that we can eventually understand these things. Um, I'm, not, I'm less certain about jet formation and, and more uncertain things like that. So as, as Stefan discussed yesterday, uh, just as a review, the review there's several sources of neutron-rich ejecta uh, during these mergers, so you have matter that's ejected tidally during the final stages of the in-spiral. This tends to be you know, essentially unprocessed neutron star material, so it's extremely neutron rich. It comes out in the equatorial plane of the binary. You also have matter that's produced uh, when the two neutron stars collide. There's a region between them that gets shock heated, and so you get some material that, that goes out, like, in the polar direction. Um, that is not quite as neutron rich because you can have weak interactions such as positron captures and neutrinos uh, turning neutrons back into protons. But both of these sources of ejecta are, are dynamical. They come out essentially during the merger itself. You can see them in your GR simulations, um, and they, they might amount to about a percentage of a solar mass. Uh, and they tend to come out, at least in the simulations, with quite high velocities. Um, but what I think is an equally important, if not more important, source of ejecta comes out later after you form this torus around the newly formed central compact object. The black hole is kind of a fussy eater, so not all of the material ends up being consumed. A lot of it is driven out in a wind. Um, and so what I'll sh talk about in a second is if, you know, 30 percent or so of the torus is unbound in such a wind, then you could actually get even more ejecta from these post-merger disk outflows than you might get dynamically. But this material comes out somewhat over longer time scales, more like the viscous time of the torus. It tends to come out with a little bit lower velocity. Um, and its composition is very sensitive to the lifetime of the central remnant. If it immediately forms in a black hole, it, this outflow tends to be quite neutron rich. If the neutron star survives for a second or so, then this outflow will, will, not, will, will not be nearly as neutron rich. So what you do is you run a simulation. You, you figure out, you know, which of your particles are being consumed by the black hole and which are being ejected in these types of winds. You follow the thermodynamic trajectories as they expand and, and decompress into space. And then you get the R process. So essentially what happens is you have a lot of neutrons relative to protons. All of your protons and some of your neutrons very quickly uh, form these, these heavy C nuclei. Uh, Stan studied this quite a, quite a bit. Uh, but you have so many neutrons left over in this context that these seeds then capture the neutrons and build up to these heavier unstable nuclei, which then have to decay back to the stable ones um, after, you know, consuming many of these neutrons. So this is, uh, Stefan showed this, this is just an R-process network. This is proton number and neutron number. As you decompress, you form these heavy uh, seeds here. And then they capture neutrons, which moves you over here. Beta decay, capture neutrons. And then, you know, this is all happening as a single fluid element is, is decompressing into space. After about a second or so, uh, you run out of neutrons, and then everything slowly decays back to uh, the stable valley over the course of hours and weeks and years. So if you have enough neutrons, you end up creating the full you know, distribution of nuclei. Um, um, now, if you want to explain in detail, you know, the second or the third R process abundance peaks, um, that depends sensitively on a lot of the, the nuclear properties off of the stable valley here, many of which haven't yet been experimentally measured. Um, but you can get a rough, you know, rough agreement. You can, you know, but, but the details are going to have to wait until we have uh, uh, better nuclear data here. Um, and for instance, if you want to detail compared to the sun or, or the abundances on some metal poor star that might be polluted by a few of these events. Um, but the important point for the kilonova is that this uh, material stays hot because it's radioactive. If you just had, you know, cold material expanding into space, by the time it became transparent to where photons could escape, it would have no thermal energy left. But the, 
radioactivity keeps it hot and keeps it glowing. So this is the radioactive power versus time, or equivalently versus radius for some expanding fluid element. Um, so if you just had a single decaying isotope like nickel-56, you'd have a constant radioactive heating followed by an exponential decay. But here you have hundreds of isotopes, so the one with a second decays to one with an hour to decays to one with a day. And when you add together all of these different uh, uh, radioactive uh, isotopes, you end up getting a, a more power law type distribution in terms of your heating. Now, of course, radioactive decay alone doesn't heat the ejecta. You have to produce these charged particles which thermalize their energy primarily through Coulomb scattering off of the plasma. Neutrinos just escape. Photons escape very quickly, but the alpha and beta decay and fission fragments can thermalize for quite a bit of time. I mean, what's crucial is what the heating rate is on time scales of roughly uh, a day or a little after the merger, because that's finally when this cloud is becoming uh, transparent to where this uh, thermal energy can escape. So it doesn't matter that you release a lot of energy here. What matters is what energy uh, you're releasing here. And I just want to point out that, you know, although this idea was around in 98, the original models produced much higher predictions for the luminosity. And so, you know, if, 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 the, if, you know, if this were true, these things would be as bright as, you know, the most luminous supernova we've ever seen. So what was crucial here in doing this calculation is you're able to figure out how much luminosity to attribute to a given gram of ejected material. So the first calculations we, we did of these in 2010, um, assuming iron opacities, but including the correct radioactive heating, predicted that these things would be about 1,000 times brighter than a, a classical nova, peaking about a day or so. So we called them a kilonova. Um, and everyone knows there was a very exciting uh, follow-up observations following the neutron star merger. It happened over the Indian Ocean. So most of the telescopes that were following this up were in Chile. So everyone had to wait for the Earth to rotate. And then there was sort of this mad, mad scramble with uh, several groups, swap collaboration discovering it first, and several groups uh, within a few, few hours um, detecting this event. Um, and then, you know, as, as we've heard, um, you know, based on having the distance, knowing the host galaxy distance, we're able to break the distance uh, inclination degeneracy. Um, and so we're able to infer that we're viewing this event between maybe 10 and, and 40 degrees off of the axis. So not directly face on. Um, but, but, you know, probably more face-on than edge-on. Okay. And so if you just took the bullometric luminosity of this decaying kilonova over the first few weeks, it actually matches quite well the, these original models. Um, and in fact, you can already kind of see this, uh, you know, t to the minus one-third if you squint your eyes, 1.3 decay you might get from the radioactive heating. Um, and I think it's instructive that these original models actually fit the data uh, so well, at least at early times. Uh, because that's telling us that actually the early emission has a fairly low opacity because our original models assumed iron opacity. Um, I'll come to that in a second. Now, you see the same things that are clearly wrong. So there's this bump in the original models, and that's due to an ionization state of iron, which we know the eject is not really iron, so it shouldn't be there, and it's not there, in fact, in the data. Um, and then also, you know, as you look at the color evolution, this thing started off, uh, as everyone knows, very blue within the first few days, and then the spectral peak moved uh, into the infrared, which was much stronger spectral evolution than you would get if the composition was just, uh, was just iron. The type 1a supernova don't, you know, don't, don't become that red so quickly. Um, so if you look at the spectral evolution of this thing, uh, this is going from the, the UV all the way up to the near infrared. Um, in early times, the first day or so, it was uh, uh, basically looked like a featureless black body, quite, quite blue in colors. Essentially, you're seeing the outer layers, which are expanding so fast that any spectral lines would be Doppler broadened away. As time goes on, you're, of course, seeing deeper into the ejecta, and you start to, to get this very strong uh, movement into the infrared, and you start to see these possibly broad absorption features, which, at least in the modeling of the kilonova, you may be able to attribute to lanthanide elements such as neodymium. But there's, this identification is very insecure because we don't actually know where most of these, uh, these lanthanide transitions actually should occur. But nevertheless, you can start to see some you know, unknown features in the, in the spectra here. So the basic point is that the kilonova colors and, uh, you know, code something about the composition of the material. If you see something that's blue and fast evolving, it doesn't have a huge UV optical opacity. It probably has an iron or a light R process nuclei composition. Uh, however, if you have these lanthanides, uh, as we've heard, uh, they have a very complex atomic structure, so many lines in the optical and UV, no radiation gets out. So, so the, the light comes out in the infrared, and you have to further wait a bit further for the ejector to expand to, to allow that radiation to escape. So you get this peak time scale more of a, of a day, of a week, sorry. And so the point is that this encodes something about how neutron-rich the ejector was. If you had a small amount of neutrons, you would 
for a large number of neutrons, you would create all of the R process, including the lanthanides, and you would expect the emission to be like this, and this is what many people thought would be all we'd see. However, if you have a component of the ejecta which is not as neutron rich, you won't have enough neutrons to capture your way up to the lanthanides, which start at about mass number 140, um, and then you will uh, have the low opacity and predict this emission. I mean, this idea was actually in place that you could see both for uh, a single event. So, for instance, if the two neutron stars collide and that produces a lot of shock heated material, which is uh, denutronized by neutrinos, um, you could get a fairly neutron poor uh, polar outflow. Um, which could produce something blue early times, um, but then at later times, if you look deeper, you see the tidal tail or more likely the outflows from the remnant accretion disk, then you would see this, this red emission following that, and you could see both uh, blue and red in a single event. And so, um, based on this kind of theoretical prior, uh, we started to, to model several groups did this. Um, this, is, this is including all of their data, but there are many groups that, that, that modeled this in terms of these two component models. A, a blue and a red kilonova, one with low opacity, one with higher opacity. Um, and what they find is that the model can't, you can't reproduce the data with either alone, but if you combine them, uh, you can get a pretty good fit. So what you find is that the blue component is a few hundredths of a solar mass expanding at about 0.2 or 0.3 C. Uh, and then the higher lanthanide rich component is a few times that, um, expanding at about a tenth the speed of light. Um, so the basic picture, which is that we have some kind of lanthanide-free or lanthanide-poor cloud coming out in the polar region, and then this is followed by uh, a more spherical or possibly equatorially uh, focused uh, uh, lanthanide-bearing component that then dominates after the first few days and, and per per persists into the infrared. Um, and so I just want to point out that I think we found, I think it's very clear just, you know, this, this original, this convinced me, you know, uh, this, that, you know, we're, we're seeing a kilonova, we're seeing the R process uh, decay. So I think we have found a site for the R process, and you know roughly how much R process we need to be produced in the galaxy over the evolution prior to the sun's formation to explain their abundances. And we now have from LIGO an actual rate per galaxy, say. Um, so you could figure out that every merger uh, would need to produce between a few thousandths and a few hundredths of a solar mass if we want to explain the solar system R process. And this single event produced several hundredths of a solar mass. and so. You know, even if the LIGO rate ends up being on the low end, in principle, a large fraction of the R process could come from uh, neutron star mergers. And of course, this was something that, that Jim originally proposed in 1974. Okay, so what are the actual physical sources of um, the ejecta? Well, the, the red component is a lot of mass coming out at a low velocity. Uh, I think it's too much material uh, to originate from a tidal tail. It's also too slow compared to what the simulations find. But I think it naturally is produced in outflows from the remnant accretion disk. This is DRMHD simulations with Daniel Siegel. Uh, we just start off with a torus similar to those that are produced during the merger. We follow its evolution, figure out how much is consumed by the black hole, how much is blown out. We follow its nuclear composition, et cetera. Uh, what we find is about 30 or 40 percent of the torus is unbound in this wind. So if you start off with a tenth of a solar mass torus, which is pretty typical if you go through a hypermassive neutron star phase, then you have the right quantity and you also have the right velocity uh, if you include the, the additional uh, PDV work you expect based on the enthalpy of the material. Uh, we get an average velocity of about 0.1 C for the ejecta. So I think, to me, I think the red component can naturally result from, from this. We don't need a highly asymmetric merger and a lot of tidal ejecta. The blue component, uh, the faster low lanthanide component, is a bit more challenging to understand. The velocities naturally suggest it's dynamical ejecta, it's the right range, but the quantity is much larger than simulations uh, generally find. Um, maybe you can do it if you have a very small neutron star radius, but even this, I think, is, is challenging uh, 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 to do, talking to some of the modelers. So I've been thinking recently about what are some other sources of ejecta that could be producing this. Um, one, I think, which is promising is if you have a long-lived outflow from this hypermassive neutron star before it collapses into a black hole. Now, there is a neutrino-driven wind that comes off of the, the remnant as it's cooling, um, but the wind, neutrino-driven wind doesn't eject enough material alone and doesn't have the right velocity. Um, but if you endow the hypermassive neutron star with a strong magnetic field, then that magnetic field both enhances the mass loss rate of the wind through centrifugal effects and also accelerates the velocity to, to uh, a few tenths of the speed of light uh, uh, if you assume uh, that the magnetic field of the remnant is a few 10 to the 14 gauss um, and is rotating at the velocity that you would expect. So 
Um, you, you, you could explain possibly this fast evolving low lanthanide component if you proposed that the hypermassive neutron star had this magnetic field and survived for a few hundredths of a millisecond, say, before collapsing into a black hole. OK, so I just want to, I'm running out of time, but I just want to say you can, you know, explore implications for the equation of state. So as I mentioned at the beginning, you have these kind of five merger outcomes. You can either promptly collapse to a black hole, you can produce an indefinitely stable neutron star, or you can produce one that is temporarily stabilized by its differential rotation or its uh, solid body rotation. And then what LIGO tells us is what is the total mass of the binary. And so the different thresholds between these possibilities depend on the total mass going in relative to the maximum mass of a non-rotating neutron star. Um, so I think we can rule out a prompt collapse in this case because we, we have too much ejecta coming out. Um, and actually Andy Bausfein turned that around and turned, and turned that into actually a lower limit on the radius of the neutron star uh, on the compactness. Um, so we, I think we can rule out that possibility. And I also think we can rule out a long-lived stable supermassive neutron star because it would inject too much rotational energy into the environment. So if you were to create one of these stable objects, it would have 10 to the 52 or 10 to the 53 ergs of rotational energy. It would have to dump before it could collapse to a black hole. Um, and that would come out on a time scale of minutes or, or hours or days. And we don't see any of that energy in the kilonova kinetic energy. We don't see any of that in the GRB jet. If you add up all that energy, you might get to 10 to the 51 ergs, whereas this remnant should have much more energy. So unless you're able to hide this rotational energy somehow by making the remnant very weakly magnetized or something, it's just really difficult. And they've done a lot of work exploring what such a magnetar would do. Uh, and it really doesn't look much like what we saw from this event. So my, my bias is that we didn't produce a long-lived supermassive neutron star. And if you uh, uh, demand that, that you don't do that, that actually places, given what LIGO observes, an upper limit on the maximum mass of a neutron star, which is around 2.2 uh, solar masses. So if you go back to this equation of state chart and you combine what everyone's discussing, we now, you know, uh, from gravitational waves, we're able to limit the radii of neutron star in some range like this. Uh, from the lack of a prompt collapse, maybe we even have a stronger lower limit on the radius. And, and from the lack of a long-lived supermassive neutron star, we can start to put an upper limit on the maximum mass. And so really, we're even with this one event, we're kind of honing in. Now, of course, a lot of these come with systematic uncertainties, especially on the GW plus EM side. So we need to see more events. But I'm very uh, uh, heartened by this. So let me just spend just a couple minutes on the future, because we hope that when LIGO reaches design sensitivity, we'll see one of these every few weeks or maybe every month at least, um, and what type of diversity would we expect to see? Um, so one thing is that the lanthanide rich ejecta blocks the lanthanide poor ejecta. So if you have a geometric configuration in which the lanthanides, for instance, come out in an equatorial tidal tail that's faster than the polar blue material, then if you're viewing this event from the equator, uh, you could actually block the blue emission. So it'll be fascinating to see an otherwise equivalent system but edge on and see if the blue kilonova is as bright. Um, likewise, I think it's a generic consequence that if you have a lower mass ingoing binary, the object will survive longer. If it survives longer, it will irradiate the disk and all of the outflows with more neutrinos that will reduce the uh, quantity of the lanthanides and make the blue component of the emission stronger relative to the red one. So this is a correlation I, I would like to look at is, is the properties of the relative strength of these two components say, for the same viewing angle uh, for different ingoing binary masses. And likewise, I would really like to see one of these long-lived things that, that doesn't collapse to a black hole and produces something qualitatively different than what we saw with this event. Maybe a very low ingoing binary mass uh, will produce a magnetar, and maybe it will or will not produce a GRB, uh, but, but it should produce a much brighter afterglow if it's really dumping 10 to the 52 ergs of rotational energy into the environment. Um, and the other exciting frontier is actually going to the first few hours uh, after the event. In this event, we only got on at 11 hours. But there's a lot of exciting physics during the first few hours. So in the first few hours, you're peering into the very outermost few percent of the ejecta, the outer 10 to the minus 4 solar masses of material. Um, so one thing that can happen is if the matter is expanding very fast, you can actually get a freeze out of the R process where you don't have time to capture the neutrons into the seed nuclei. So you end up with a bunch of free neutrons on the outer layers. And as those decay into protons, they actually dump a lot of heat in. And that can actually substantially brighten uh, the emission as compared to what you would get if you didn't have these neutrons during the first few hours. Um, and there's also recently been a lot of discussion by, by Monsi and, and her, her group about the fact that if this GRB jet breaks through the ejected cloud, 
um, it will impart some additional thermal energy, um, reheating of the ejecta, which could also influence the light curves in the first few hours. Uh, I think these are going to be somewhat degenerate if we see bright emission, brighter emission during the first few hours. Uh, we may not be able to tell if it's neutrons or jet reheating, but either would be very exciting, and we'll work on distinguishing them later. I just want to point out that, you know, a jet is not the only way to reheat material that's been ejected. Uh, if you have any type of time variable outflow, there will be internal shocks uh, which, which reheat the material, and, and if, if you raise the entropy, you'll be able to increase the brightness on time scales of a few hours. So whatever it is, if we get on in the first few hours, we're probing the engine that's creating this ejecta. Um, so I'm just going to finish. I'll say I think maybe it's a bit snobby, but I do think this was a fairly well-behaved merger insofar as the different counterparts that we saw were either seen before or had been discussed, you know, theoretically. So you can create a sort of concordance picture for this event. Um, so the two neutron stars coalesced either from their collision or from the long-lived hypermassive neutron star. There was a, a, a polar component of low lanthanide material that came out which powered the blue kilonova we saw over the first few days. Then you uh, collapse into a black hole. Uh, that black hole may produce a jet which comes out, makes the weak gamma ray burst somehow, maybe through a shock breakout, maybe through an actual successful jet, uh, and then also powered the non-thermal x-rays and radio. Uh, but then the outflows from that accretion disk, which are quite massive, uh, come out at lower velocity and power the sustained infrared emission. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, we have this concordance picture, and it will be tested by future events that have slightly different properties, hopefully, than the one we've seen. And I do have a number of open questions, but I'll just uh, leave them up there for the question session. Thanks. So Stefan uh, Roswell yesterday uh, indicated that uh, the amount of ejecta could be more than 4% of a solar mass. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and if we assign uh, a quarter of the speed of light to that, uh, the kinetic energy carried by this material uh, could be a substantial fraction of the total binding energy when the two neutron stars touch each other. Uh, because uh, the, the escape speed, I mean the gravitational potential gives you roughly a tenth of the speed of light on the surface. So um, my question to you is, can you envision a physical process that will carry a substantial fraction of the binding energy with 4% uh, of the material and eject it? Uh, you mentioned that it's difficult, but can you envision? Uh, what, what well, I should say that I, th I, don't, I, I think we, that we, the large quantity, the 6%, 5%, I mean, the velocities that we infer for that uh, are actually more like 0.1c. So it's, it's not enormous. Uh, the total kinetic energy is, is, is 10 to the 51 ergs. Um, uh, but, but the process I would envision is, like I said, you have an accretion disk, you have a wind from the accretion disk. It's tapping into a large fraction of that gravitational potential energy. If you form a torus with a mass of 0.1 or 0.15 solar masses, which is pretty typical, and 30 or 40 percent of that is unbound in a wind, then it's, it's not unreasonable to get these, uh, these quantities. So I, th I, my, that's, I think the very large quantity is telling us that there was a large outflow from the accretion disk, which means there was a hypermassive neutron star. Stan. Yeah, super, supernovae are also alleged to make some of the R process anyway. Uh, what is the lightest element or atomic mass that you think there's strong evidence for being made in this event? The lightest. Um, I, I think it's really difficult for our modeling to distinguish uh, if the R process starts at, uh, you know, if you have low enough YE, you, you skip over the, the first peak and you just sort of start at the second and third peak. And, and it's really difficult, I think, uh, to, to, to distinguish the opacity between iron group nuclei and the light R process nuclei. So I would say we don't have any strong evidence for the light being produced so in this the event. First peak is still up for grabs. The, the first peak is definitely still up for grabs and, and still may happen in supernova. And I'm not, there are other issues with, with mergers we can talk offline. I, it's not a panacea for. <laughs> so. Hi, Brian. Um, you mentioned few hours for the first few hours are important. Can you be more precise and uh, tell us how soon you would like to observe the remnant? So how uh, soon after merger? How soon? Okay. Well, yeah. um, th I think there's different things we can look for. I mean, the, the one people usually talk about is the oscillations of the 
hypermassive neutron star remnant. So that's going to tell us whether there was a hypermassive neutron star or prompt collapse. So that would be like time scales of, of tens of milliseconds or, or 100 milliseconds or something. But I don't know that observation alone, I don't know will tell us the ultimate fate because we'll see the hypermassive neutron star oscillating and when those oscillations damp, you know, either it collapses into a hole or it's still stable at that point. So I think we'll be able to rule out a prompt collapse by seeing the oscillations. Now, if we then see, say, a periodic source, you know, from the spinning down highly magnetized neutron star, you know, that would tell us, okay, now we have a super, ma but I think that's very challenging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so let me just, uh, so I really meant from electromagnetic point of oh, view. I, I don't think we will be able to okay. see okay, the sorry. oscillations of neutron star, okay. Okay, hypermassive sorry. neutron star at, that, at those distances. Uh, so Any purely point? from EM point of view, okay, gamma okay. rays, you know, kilonova. I, I, so I think the kilonova, to me, the interesting time scales are, are you know, are kind of hour, hour ish or tens of minutes ish or something. I, I, but there are other things like people talk about very prompt x ray signals uh, that, that I think would really necessitate, you know, getting down to seconds or so. So, um, but I don't know how, I guess we're probably limited by the sluice speed of whatever telescope you're, you're dealing with. Um, so, but I, I think I don't, I don't know of any motivation for getting on, you know, yet for getting on, say, before the coalescence finishes, because I don't know of any instrument that will be limited or be able to slew. Uh, Brian, so given the difficulty of identifying any individual element or elements, our process elements yeah. in, the, in the spectra, um, I guess the strongest, strongest evidence for our process is the T to the minus 1.3 um, de right, decay. Right. Now, you did that back in 2010 and predicted T to the minus 1.3. Given the, the Lipiner and Roberts calculations of trajectories, What's the uncertainty in that, or is there is there an update to what we might expect from the um, from the part? The, the, the minus one point three is 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 pretty robust. If if you're as Stefan discussed, if your electron fraction is less than about point three or so, um, it, because the, you, even though we don't know the nuclear properties very well in an aggregate sense, it kind of the statistics washes out. So it, it might be one point two or one point four or something, but it's it's pretty it's it's you know pr pretty narrow. But as Stefan said, if you go to higher electron fraction. If we said that the YE was 0.4 or 0.5 in this event, then we would expect individual isotopes to start to dominate. Instead of seeing this, this T to the minus 1.3, we would see you know, one with a half-life going into another half-life. There would be a lot of plateaus and weird things uh, probably in the, in the emission. So it's pretty robust if, if we have actual R process material. 